All right, so what is an elliptic curve? Um, I've been talking about Edwards curves the whole time and sometimes interspersingly saying um, elliptic curve or Edwards curves. Um, how did we use to introduce elliptic curve photography before we had Edwards curves? Um, this is going to be rather theoretical for the beginning. You should come back if that's too much over your head. Make sure to come back when I get to slide five. Um, until then, it's more mathy, somewhat well, explaining VD how the official definition is. It's kind of necessary to do this, but we're not going to use anything about it. So, well, okay, the first one is meant to be over your head. So the official algebraic geometry definition of an elliptic curve is that it's a smooth projective plane curve of genus 1 with at least one point. All right, let's go to something more comprehensible. Um, if you actually plug this in into some pretty deep math theorem called riemann roch theorem, then you can come up with that anything which fits this definition can be written as something which is much more hands-on, namely as a equation which has degree at most 2 in or degree exactly 2 in y, degree exactly 3 in x, and then there are some mixed terms in those. So any elliptic curve can be written as an equation of y squared plus a1xy a3y equals x cubed plus a2x squared plus a4x plus a6. And I have a comment at the bottom that the indices sort of make, then, make sense. Um, it does when you look at each of those. So y you give weights 3 and x you give weight 2. And then the index in the a is the missing weight. So over here you have a y which has weight 3, so squared gives weight 6, x has weight 2, y has weight five, uh, 3, so it gives 5, plus 1 is 6, here y has 3, plus 3 is 6, so you can actually argue why these indices are like this and why there is none which has index 5, um, but explaining uh, how we get there, that is really beyond this lecture. Um, so Riemann-Roch gives you that there's this thing, and, well, it has this curve shape, but not everything of this curve shape is an elliptic curve. That's a little bit like uh, for Edwards curves, we had to say that d is not a uh, 0 and d is not 1. So we have to do some exceptions to deal with this smooth part. So smooth means that the curve doesn't have singularities. And this curve shape is called a Weierstrass curve. So as opposed to Edwards curve, this is called a Weierstrass curve. Now, what is a singularity? Um, a singularity is something that's easiest explained with, with pictures. It means that if you draw the curve over the wheels, so over the fine fields, we have to do some gymnastics again. But if you draw it, say, over the wheels, and, okay, so here we have a curve which I'm using in U and V coordinates to say, okay, well, these are not our X and Y, which are over the fine field, then you would have either a pointy thing here, that is called a cusp, or you would have such a thing which we call a node. And the definition says that um, it's singular if we do not have a well-defined derivative. So here we have, well, the derivative looks like it's a horizontal line because we're coming in kind of with a positive slope here and with a negative slope here. So in this particular point, it's not well defined. Here, in this point, we even have two slopes, so we can't even argue what the right derivative here is. And so a singular point is a point on the curve. So over here is no singular point anywhere. anywhere. Um, over here or there or whatever. It has to be a point on the curve, and it has to satisfy both of the partial derivative equations. So this is what we get if we take the Weierstrass curve equation and compute derivative with respect to y. So okay, we had it y squared here, so it becomes 2y, and then we get y terms of those. And on the other one, this is the one we get when we compute the derivative with respect to x. So this is derivatives as you have seen in calculus. And then we're looking for points that satisfy these two equations and the curve equation, so three equations. And so if you're taking say this curve that's y squared equals x cubed, then you would be getting a point 0, 0 is a singular point. So a curve is non-singular or smooth 
if there doesn't exist a single point. Now I've been highlighting that it has to be on the curve, but this is another kind of um, place where you have a stumbling stone, where you really fall into something. Namely, if you're looking at fine fields, you would be saying, how oh, well, I looked at this and my fine field is just F7. I looked at all the seven possibilities for X. I looked at all the seven possibilities for Y and none of them work. Unfortunately, the definition is a geometric kind of definition, which means we're looking at the fine field itself and any extension field. So not just F7, but also F49 and F7 cubed, F7 fourth, and so on. And so you can't exhaustively enumerate it. You really have to show that those three equations do not have a common solution, no matter what extension field you go to. Now, the good news is, if you have three equations, typically, well, two variables, typically those don't have solutions. But you can fall into a case where you have uh, solutions. Now, this was the most general form of a Weierstrass curve. And for most things in cryptography, we're happy with using large primes. And so we want to make our curve equation a little bit simpler. Now, for that, I have to talk about isomorphisms. And isomorphisms are well, valid transformations, that means those keep the curve shape looking the same. So they have to be defined everywhere. They have to be polynomials in x and y, and they must not change the maximum degree. So we had a y square with no coefficient on the left, and we had an x cubed with no coefficient, well, coefficient 1 on the right, the x cubed here. And so, well, those are having coefficient 1, and so if I take the x, if you take the y and transform it into anything in x, okay, that can work. I'm getting a y squared, so I get another x squared, which I have. But if I would take the x and transform it into anything as y, you would see a y cubed, which we don't have. So what I'm allowed to do is doing linear changes of variables where the y can change, including an x, and the x cannot change, including x. So for the x, I can only do a multiple of x, and then some constant term. For the y, I can do a multiple of y, multiple of x, and some constant term. Do you know that I've been plugging in some related coefficients on top of the top coefficients here? Namely, I need to ensure that I'm getting again coefficient 1 in front of the y squared and in front of the x cubed. So if I'm taking the y squared, I'm getting an alpha to the 6. If I'm taking the x cubed, I'm getting an alpha to the 6. And so if I then divide the whole equation by alpha to the 6, I'm again back to having something one. So for that, I have to ensure that these two coefficients here are related. So that's my toolbox. Now, I want to assume a few things. I want to assume that I'm not in characteristic 2. And also, yeah, it's going to be in the next step nice to have not characteristic 3. So let's assume that our in characteristic p, where p is a large prime, so definitely larger than 3. And that allows us to go to something which has far fewer variables. So we first going to do a completion of the square on the left. So we had this y square plus, well, here's the term, a1, x1, and a3, uh, a1, xy, and a3, y. And we want to get rid of that one. So we completing the square by, well, subtracting this term there. And so that allows us to get to something which has a pure y on the left and then some updated coefficients on the right. And similarly, if we don't have characteristic 3, we can get rid of this term by doing a transformation. So here we need the characteristic is not 2, so we can divide by 2. Here we need the characteristic 3 is not 3, so we can divide by 3. And so now we have um, a curve equation, which is y squared equals x cubed and then just the linear term in x and the constant term. Remember this thing which I explained about the indices always summing up to 6 when taking the weights of x and y. So the term in front of the x has a 4 and the constant term has a 6. But when we're in this short form where the other ones are 0, it's common to call them c rather than a. Historical reasons. Okay, so this is called short Weierstrass form. And now is the moment that people should wake up again. So ring ring, um, short Weierstrass form. Um, so here's the elliptic curve equation uh, for short Weierstrass form is of the form y squared equals x cubed plus c4x plus c6. 
and this is an elliptic curve if it's non-singular if you get what singular means well go back a few slides or listen carefully now namely we must avoid that there is well a singularity that means we have a derivative of those things now in this case the derivatives got a lot simpler here the derivative with respect to y is just 2y and if that's zero then y is zero so we're looking at um, this guy being zero so the right hand side must be zero and we're also looking at the derivative of the right hand side being zero and that happens only if the right hand side has a double root and that you can translate into the discriminant which looks like this so the curve is non-singular if this expression is non-zero so a short Weierstrass curve is an elliptic curve and has this condition on the terms other than that um, they're pretty free so we have an fp for some reason this is not the normal bold phase f um, and we're getting well our fine field with p elements we must exclude this relation and we have a short Weierstrass form uh, for p larger than 3 we have done only transformations which are invertible so it's the most general form any elliptic curve in that case can be written this way so we have well it seems two parameters but they sort of depend it's like with edwards curves you also have the a and the b but essentially only one of them is really free the other one has a little bit of wiggle room okay so there is some complication in this form I said before that I prefer talking about Edwards curves because the addition form is nicer. Think of the starfish, you're seeing all of the points. Well, again, that's a picture of the wheels, but it gives you an idea that there's nothing at infinity. I also showed you the picture for other Ds where you would have points shooting to infinity, either the traffic circle or these, uh, well, looks like parabolas, but they're not, uh, which have points at infinity. Now, also here for this curve shape, you have points at infinity. And the standard way of defining the addition law is actually taking this one point infinity um, as the neutral element. And so while we have something which is symmetric to the y x uh, to the x-axis, because we have a y squared here, and well, let me just flip it up on the next page. This is one of the ways that this elliptic curve can look like. So we have a cubic equation, and a cubic equation over the reals has either one root or two roots. I'm showing you the one root case here. I have the two roots case on the next page. So, well, this is the one point where we have a root and then it goes off up here and symmetrically down there. And the neutral elements of this point of infinity you can think of infinitely far out in the y-coordinate. So if I were now in class standing in front of a blackboard, I would be jumping under the ceiling to explain that, yes, it's all the way up there. It's also actually all the way down there. It's well, if you think of projective geometry, it's where those lines meet. So it's it's a point which you can't really see. And that is the most important point. It's a neutral element of this group operation. Now, how do I find define the group operation? This is something which some people like about uh, Weierstrass curves, that you have this geometric addition law, but then if you have to prove that it's actually an addition law, it gets pretty ugly. So the definition says that any points that are on the same line add up to zero or add up to the neutral element. so for instance here we have a vertical line here in red that is well two points on there and i've now denoted them with plus something and minus something so this point is the negative of that point because these two points add up to infinity also here on the blue line we're having three points and so this point plus this point plus this point add up to zero or this point is known as the negative of the sum of the two of them and that actually defines addition law so first of all if you look at the negative of a point um, it is the point that is mirrored with respect to the x-axis so in the Weierstrass addition law x stays the same and y flips the sign uh, flips the sign so don't confuse this with the Edwards curve addition law where y stays the same and x flips here it's the y coordinate that flips now how do we add points in this form if i want to add p1 and p2 then while well, i draw a line through them i'm hitting another point okay at this point you have to prove that there is a unique third point we're skipping this because well 
we have actually seen that it's a nice group law for the Edwards curve case, and we're going to show how these things are related. So we have done the proof in a nice case. Here I'm just showing you, yeah, it works. Uh, so this point is the negative of the sum of those two points. So we want to get the positive of the sum. So we have to come up with a vertical line. This is the sum of the two points. So again, to add two points, you draw a line through them to find the third point of intersection, and then you mirror it with respect to the x-axis. So you're having the same y coordinate, the uh, same x coordinate, negative sign on the y coordinate. Okay, so that explains how to add two separate points. But well, what if you want to double a point? In the case that you want to double a point, the two points getting infinitesimally small together, so instead of having p and r together here, uh, p and q together here, they're getting closer and closer until you have, well, you're getting a tangent at p. So first of all, here's a picture of a, a elliptic curve with three um, real roots on the right hand side. So then you're seeing kind of a separate bubble here. Again, it's nice and symmetric. It's not a circle. Um, and then some other body which looks pretty similar. Um, but the interesting part on this side is the addition law. So if you're having a doubling a point, you take the tangent, you find your third point of intersection. So this is a double point on the, on the tangent finding the third point of intersection, and again you're mirroring it with respect to the x-axis and find the intersection point. Okay, this is something you can do on your sheet of paper with a ruler or something, but this is nothing you can teach your computer, and this is also nothing, you, well, maybe with a computer algorithm system, but this is nothing you can do over FP. We don't have a concept of, of tangents, or this is nothing we can do there. This is similar to how we introduced addition on Edwards curves and then went over to find fields and had to prove or on the clock and then had to prove it's still fine. Now here it's a little bit more complicated um, because it's not all fine. Um, if you have a Weierstrass curve then you actually have a case distinction there. So if you're adding two points you first have to check whether one of them is a point of infinity. Well you first check whether the point P1 is a point of infinity in which case the sum of the two points is the second point. That also works if P2 is infinity, then, then it's well, just infinity, right? So that's fine. Now if P2 is infinity, same story, except for I made a typo, this is supposed to be P1 in that case. Sorry for that. So I'll fix that before the slides go up. Okay, these were the if cases. Now we're getting into the else if cases. So now we have excluded any of our points as infinity. Also note that um, if you're a programmer, you should think about how do you even represent infinity on your computer? It's not so bad. We actually normally work with uh, three tuples rather than well, two tuples, like x and y. We actually work with x, y, and z, and then there is a valid representation of the point infinity. But it's still, it's not nice. You have to watch out that you don't accidentally have infinity there. The next special case is that you're having two points that are each other's negative, that you're adding these two points which are on a vertical line. And then you need to go for the special point infinity as the result of your addition law. Okay, so now three cases in. Now the fourth case, if they're not opposite, then you can ask whether they're equal. And it's very important that you have excluded that they're each other's opposite in order to avoid that you're in a, um, say, at the, the bump at the front of the curve at the point with the interaction intersection with this x coordinate. That would be a tangent line, which is vertical. But we're now in a case where P2 is not equal to P1, but we're in P2 equals to P1. So now we're in a case of doubling, and we're looking at the tangent. Okay, so if you actually go through the exercise of computing the slope of the tangent, this is what the slope of the tangent looks like. And then you're computing what the third point of intersection is on this curve, and you're finding it has this x-coordinate, then you're finding a y-coordinate, and then you have to flip the y-coordinate. And when you have done all of this, you're getting that that is the y3. So the point that you get by adding or by doubling p1 has the coordinate x3 and y3, which look like that. Now in the final case, that is the most general case, there is no special relationship with p1 and p2. They're in general position, and none of them is infinity. Then we have, oh, there's another type, or this is supposed to be an x sub 2, subscript 2. 
um, so well, the, the generalization of this one, so minus x1, x2, so that's what happens here, and then, well, that is the same, and now the set of the tangent, we have just the line going through the two points. It's not terrible, but you have to really watch out. You must not mess up because, for instance, if you're just messing up the test down here, and these two cases are pretty general, each point you could double. And if you're accidentally using the addition formulas, if you want to double, you're in a situation that you're dividing by x1 minus x2. And if, well, if you happen to double, or also if you're in the case up here that you're adding the negative of the point, you're suddenly encountering a division by zero. Well, division by zero is not defined, so you're ending up into something which gets you into the wrong formula. So even if you end up having this, this three-tuple representation where you can represent infinity, this gets you into a special case of addition law where it's not defined, and so that is where um, some of the finicky parts coming in from the, from the addition law. Now, in the Edwards curve addition law, I was warning you that you should make sure that when you're choosing a curve to make it nice that you're choosing a non-squared d and so on. Well, in this case, there is nothing that's equivalent to being a non-squared d. You don't have anything that avoids it. If you're doing the double and add method, you're going to double all the time. So there is no escape from it. So Weierstrass curves, you really have to implement both cases and watch out. Anyway, we'll get to something nicer next week. See you.